this computer. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crusade Against Ignorance. I have a very special and exciting video for you today with two special guests. Uh, most of you will probably know my good friend, Joe Schmid. We've had uh, a lot of philosophical projects together. And uh, first time channel guest, Dr. Eric Steinhardt. Uh, thank you for being here, Dr. Steinhardt. You're welcome. Happy to be here. So um, today we're going to be talking about a number of things relating to what's called religious naturalism, you know, religious and spiritual practices under the guise of the worldview naturalism. Um, Dr. Steinhardt has done work on this and is kind of involved in an ongoing research project about this. He is a professor of philosophy at William Patterson University. Uh, he has a website, lots of books, lots of research projects. I will link his website in the description of this video. So if you want to find uh, any information about him or his work, I'll also link his YouTube channel. He has some great content on there. So if you're interested in uh, reading up on anything he's working on, um, you can find it there. And I'll let him introduce himself as well in a second. Joe, most of you know, runs the Majesty of Reason YouTube channel, which I'll also link, of course, in case you somehow haven't heard of it, uh, as well as his blog. Lots of great content on both of those. So as far as general introductions, that's what I'll do. Uh, so Joe, I'll turn it over to you. If you want to introduce yourself as well, anything I left out, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you for having me on. I'm really looking forward to discussing this. Um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because I'm sort of an outsider to this discussion because as many of the people in the audience know, but some of them may not, like I'm neither an atheist nor a naturalist. Instead, I'm an agnostic. And so um, I'm really interested in in this project because it's sort of teetering on, you know, I, I'm interested in both theistic religions, but also maybe religious inclinations that might arise with respect to naturalism. So um, I'm really excited for, for this discussion. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I do philosophy, both popular with respect to my blog and my book and my YouTube, but also scholarly. So, you know, writing papers and re researching and things like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so uh, again, check out Joe's stuff, I'll link it. Uh, I, of course, as you will know, I am an atheist and a naturalist, so I'm hoping to maybe come out of this uh, as a religious naturalist, you know, if I can find some sort of a spiritual practice I fit into. I mean, I've always enjoyed pagan aesthetics, I guess, so maybe I can cultivate that into a, a richer, deeper spiritual practice, and Dr. Steinhardt can help me with that. But um, yeah, so uh, Eric, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well, anything I left out or anything else you want to plug or just general introductions, uh, yeah, go ahead. I think you guys have summed it up. Yeah, I mean, I'm Eric Steinhardt. I'm a professor of philosophy, William Patterson University. I got a website. Um, and so I'm going to let you guys ask me questions. <laughs> awesome. Sounds perfect to me. So um, I've got, as I've told you guys a little bit, I've got a list of introductory questions here. Um, and at regular intervals, when I'm asking a couple of these, I'll uh, give breaks. And Joe, if you have any questions come up or anything you want to expound on, I'll leave some space for you. And of course, if you want to ask anything, feel free to jump in. Um, so I figured it'd be a good place to start. We're hopefully going to get into some content of a particular specific paper that I, um, Eric wrote. But uh, before that, we're going to do some preliminary stuff on just this general research project. So I guess it'd be a good place to start. Um, what is religious naturalism, for one thing? Just what is it? What is this project? What is this field? And uh, what kind of got you interested in it? What got you down this, um, this road of, of researching this? Because it's a relatively, I guess, probably new or niche field. There's some other people like... Um, Donald Crosby that have written some books on it, but it's still relatively new. So uh, what is this project and kind of what got you down the road of researching it? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I mean, I started out, uh, you know, in an, an evangelical conservative Protestant family and church and pretty much everybody in my family uh, is a minister. Uh, <laughs> so I have some genetic uh, defect that makes me inclined to um, to these kinds of questions, but the kind of religion that I grew up in is actually is, is actually pretty much gone now. And it was a, you know, a Pennsylvania German, uh, you know, Appalachian kind of culture. I mean, I've seen snakes handled in church. Uh, I've yeah, I've seen I've seen the thing, man. <laughs> um, and it was a religion that was very different than what comes down to us from a kind of Calvinist version of Protestantism. So I got into so so that that kind of you know Pennsylvania German religion has an enormous amount of stuff about it's kind of a nature religion already in a lot of ways um, it's very you know mystical pietism very and it's into a lot of woo woo stuff that they thought was Christian right I mean like powwowing you know healing kind of shy. it's very you know I I call it a kind of Appalachian shamanism and uh, and I wouldn't be the first to say that but. Um, this kind of, you know, I mean, I came out of that, you know, um, disenchanted with Christianity and with theism. I'm not a theist. 
Um, and so, but I still, you know, retain my cultural background. So one of the things that always bothered me um, about a lot of, of atheistic stuff was it's sort of negativity and, and nihilism. And, and I know that's not fair as a general stereotype, but you know, it often comes off that way. And I often would see these kind of atheists sort of constantly losing the public battles for you know, people's hearts and minds. And I think in many ways, there are a lot of reasons for that, okay. But I think one of the things that sort of, you know, I'm attracted to nature. I'm an old, you know, hippie, New England, go into Vermont and scream at the trees, um, which is what all my ancestors did anyway. Um, and so um, I started wondering like, what, what, you know, how do we integrate, uh, you know, so atheism to me doesn't mean no religion. It means no God. Um, and realizing that there's Buddhism and all these other approaches to, to uh, religiosity and you know, being a philosophy professor and having to teach ancient philosophy and things like that, you learn that there's just other ways um, to approach these questions. And I always thought that the, one of the best ways to kind of break up the hegemony of Christianity in the United States, which is really what you know, I object to the most, um, is that there need to be positive cultural alternatives, you know, so people can feel like they have a place to fit in with, with their minds and their hearts and that it's not either you have, you know, Christian theism or you have, you know, atheistic nihilism or naturalistic nihilism, you know, and so I th and I think that there is a large, large space for you know an alternative, a third, a third way. It's been there in the United States all along. You know, America's always had this kind of nature religion under its underneath the kind of Calvinism, and you know, and Emerson, Thoreau, everybody knows them. But um, it's there, and I would like there to be positive cultural you know, institutions and structures so that Christianity isn't the only thing that people have on the shelf when, you know, they have a weird experience uh, and people have weird experiences all the time. And then it's like, oh, it must be God. It's gotta be God because I, I look on my, you know, I look in my room to find what it could be and all that's there is the Bible, you know, or all that's there is the, the uh, evangelical church down the road. And, you know, non-theists and naturalists have often mostly engaged in a negative project, right? Criticizing Christianity, um, often sort of just mirroring it in this weird negative way. But we need, if we're, if there's going to, anything is going to come out of this, it's got to be new positive things, right? So that's how I got into religious naturalism, trying to think about, and I don't put any stock in the word religious, right? Spiritual naturalism, passionate rationalism, you know, Sagan pagan, I, you know, these labels don't matter to me as much as like, well, what are, what are you doing? Yeah. Wait, why, why is a uh, pastafarianism not enough for you? No, I'm just, <laughs> you know, I like pastafarianism. I tried to work with a, a law professor about writing up a sort of defense of it in a certain point, but I think it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's kind of run its course. I yeah. don't know. It seems a bit par too parasitic. It's, it's almost like we want like a genuine kind of, well, we, as in putting my little naturalist hat on, we want a sort of genuine, <laughs> more robust kind of um, naturalistic religion that isn't wholly parasitic on um, other, other religions, ma mainly American Christianity, as you, were, as you were saying. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, and it's often a news to people when they hear about like, well, you know, there was an Appalachian form of Christianity that, I mean, it ends up being kind of woo-woo, but they thought astrology and, and shamanistic trance work and, uh, and magic. I mean, I got great books on Pennsylvania German magic, man. You know, like that's like, I mean, you would, you know, these, you would, if you were just looking at this stuff, you would wonder like, are these people like just pagans? Or so, yeah, I'm interested in all the other other things and they're there, right? The, the reference to there is like, this is not, a lot of this stuff's not alien. 
like that it's been forgotten or dominated by a particular kind of Calvinist puritanical sort of Protestantism in the US. And I think, you know, we all need to just get away from the right. The Pastafarianism is kind of like a parody of that, right? And and you find, I find naturalists and atheists, like the naturalistic concept of the supernatural. What's that? It's just Christian. And then you have a naturalism that's just tied to Christianity. Uh, and I think my thought is it's time to kind of get away from that. So. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I resonate with a lot of that. And I know it's funny um, the way you phrase all that. I know you've done some work on Nietzsche as well, and it all some of that all sounds um, rather Nietzschean in the sense of you know building, constructing our own systems in the ashes of uh, the death of God or what you know what have you. All that great imagery we get from Nietzsche. Um, so that kind of everything you say there about sort of having a legitimate alternative to give like actual deep meaning still sounds uh, sounds good to me. It's, it's all very interesting. So um, thanks for that answer. It was great. So it kind of leads me very well into my next question, um, some of the remarks you made on how people view naturalism and it being like sort of a negative or a parasitic almost on Christian understandings of value. Um, how would you then, how would you define naturalism? Do you define it as like a broader worldview or as a metaphysical thesis? So for example, we've talked a little bit about um, someone like Graham Oppie who does work on natural, he's a book called Naturalism and Religion. And he argues for naturalism as just being about a thesis about causal reality, basically a metaphysical thesis about causal reality, and he defines it as the thesis that you know the causal reality contains only natural objects and events. Um, and on his view, that would probably be translate to roughly to something like you know physicalist or materialist objects. So, um, would you agree with that definition, or would you build in maybe more possibilities for um, maybe non-physical things? So, how would you just, I guess, in general, define naturalism since we're talking about it being kind of um, amiable to kind of more religious conceptions of nature and the divine um, as far as how you characterize the worldview. Would you kind of agree with Oppie's definition or maybe build some more into it? How would you define it? Yeah, um, I, I would not agree with Oppie's definition. Um, I would define this uh, quite differently actually in a paper that I, I, I wrote for him um, in one of his volumes. Um, and I, I mean, I worry about some of those older definitions. I mean, his definition is fair enough. It's a bit older and he's changed it sometimes over the course of the religion and naturalism books. Really good book, by the way, uh, something I really enjoyed. And um, I, I mean, look, the causal stuff, everybody thinks that every, I mean, astrologers think that the planets and stars have causal effects on earth. And like, I guess they sort of do, but not like your horoscope. I mean, people who do Reiki think that, you know, the Reiki master has a causal effect on your body. And, you know, that's an interesting point because probably they, they've probably misinterpreted it. And I use, this is one, so here's one of the things I, I'm interested in. I look at people and, uh, you know, like I have people, other family members who are into like getting Reiki done to them. And at first I'm like, this is all pseudoscientific bullshit. And I'm kind of like, you know, the atheist asshole who just has to tell his lovely niece what an idiot she is. And it's sort of realizing like, oh man, what, what, I'm, what a jerk I am. And so I wanted to, so think about that kind of causality. It actually turns out that something like Reiki actually probably works on people who have like that ASMR thing, you know, that, uh, autonomous sensory meridian response where there are certain gestures or sounds or things that induce sort of trance-like states. And so, yeah, it's not doing anything spooky, but Reiki isn't supernatural. Even, even if it worked the way they said with energy and flows from your hands and stuff to the, from the Reiki master's chi or whatever it is, no, that's all happening like in a room in, you know, the strip mall off Route 10 or something. It's not supernatural. It's false, right? That explanation of it is false, but something is happening. And, uh, and what might be happening is just the purely physical stuff about a guy moving his hand, you know, the Reiki master moving his or her hands around and a person lying on a table. And that's already a weird enough context that all kinds of People go into, people get, it actually looks a lot like early hypnotism, early ways of trance induction. 
So none of that's supernatural. And most of the new age stuff that you see or woo woo stuff that people talk, it's not supernatural. Nothing is ever claimed to be outside of the causal order of nature. And even like the Christian God, you know, the evangelical Protestant God is supposed to be causing things in nature all the time on earth for people who go to church. Um, he found me a parking space one time. That's spatio-temporal causal interaction. Now, so, I mean, if you want the supernatural in, in, some, in that old sense, you really got to go to something like Plato's form of the good or Plotinus is one or the ground of being or something really obscure. So I just think that, so I, I wanted something that avoids, and also science, right? I mean, like, you don't know what science is going to say. You know, we, you don't, we don't, that's the dismal induction. You don't know, it's like suddenly science discovers that everything is really made out of ghosts. You know, and, and then what? So I didn't want to have to be tied to those kinds of conceptions. So this paper I wrote for uh, Graham's book, you know, I basically just said, look, you look at the thing, you know, you look at the Reiki book, you look at the astrology book, and if it's got math, it's natural. And I'm not saying mathematical objects exist or not. I don't care. I just, does the book contain equations? And if you look in the Reiki books, there are no equations. There's no differential equation that connects the Reiki master's hands to the body of the patient, right? There's no equations for dowsing. There's no equations for, you would think if new age energy is really energy, and I don't care, I'm, I'm open to anything, but you would think that there would be equations that describe its flow. Um, and again, if you know God really can read my mind uh, when I pray, then there's information passing from my mind to God's mind. And even if we're all immaterial, that information can be quantified in bits. So there's a baud rate and there's a channel and there's an entropy of the channel. And actually that means there's gotta be something like a temperature of the channel too, and a temperature of God. And I mean, there's a temperature of my brain. So you should see equations. You should see some serious, like, you know, the, the mutual information, right? The kind of mutual entropy of me and God's mind that equation doesn't say anything about immateriality or materiality. It's just about information. And if God can hear my prayers, God got some information. And so, so you look in the books about prayer, does prayer work? Well, you should see some equations that use a lot of information theory. And in fact, how many equations do you find in all those books? Zero. So my, my view is just if there's equations in it, and the equations aren't bullshit. I mean, Jacques Lacan used equations in some of his, you know, uh, psychoanalytic books, but they're just like ornamental graffiti or something, right? I mean, he never actually talks about what the quantities involved are. So if there's equations and it's not just being used decoratively, then I say it's, it's natural, right? You look in science books, there's equations, biology books, chemistry, immunology, physics, obviously there's equations. Yay for the equations. <laughs> so I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't tie, you know, like there's some people say like, oh, the natural means it's not supernatural. What's the supernatural? It's the not natural. So the natural is the not, not natural. And you're like, I, I, it's like, I thought there was a dog around here somewhere, man, because it's chasing its tail. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just said, are there, you know, you'll pick up the book. Are there equations in it? Then it's talking about something natural. Okay. I like, yeah, that's interesting. So then would you maybe then agree uh, more with like the more methodological naturalist point of just about using the natural sciences as our main touchstone for reality and making progress, learning about causal reality? It seems like what you're saying would be, uh, you know, pretty sympathetic to that. That's kind of the second part of naturalism that I'll be. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, I just think that, look, what's got equations in it is natural. Oh, okay. So That's I don't, good. so I don't, you know, I don't, if, you know, and I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure here that the natural is what you want to go for. Right. I mean, there are people who do natural theology and there are people who think like God is natural. Right. So I'm much more interested in working out, right. And working out kinds of, there, there are different cultural things here. Right. And so that's that's where I'm interested in taking the, the concept of nature or naturalism. And there are obviously people that are pantheists, right, who say nature is God. Right. And 
they're happy with science, right? I mean, they think it's physics that reveals the nature of God or cosmology or something. And so, so I don't, yeah, like methodological or metaphysical naturalism, man, that's, that's back to the future stuff, man. That's, that's like from the 1980s. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's interesting. Great. Joe, did you have, I see you unmuted a second ago. Do you have something you wanted to ask on that? Oh, well, no, I mean, I guess um, just with respect to this particular paper of giving thanks to the sun and, and other sort of deep agents, uh, why in particular, like what inspired you to write this paper in particular? Uh, yeah, what it, that's, that paper has had a kind of interesting um, history. So I, I'm very interested in a kind of movement called atheopaganism. Um, there's a guy, Mark Green, started a group of atheopagans, big Facebook group, got some books out, things like that. Uh, and I've, you know, I've gone to the, uh, uh, well, so I'm, in, you know, I love Carl Sagan's work um, and Dawkins' work and was thinking that still there are, you know, things people want to do, like express gratitude. Um, and I listened to Dawkins' lecture on gratitude that he gave uh, a while back now, um, where he says it's kind of this going off in a vacuum, this sort of false you know, you have a desire to count, cal you calculate debt sort of naturally and you feel like you owe something to the earth or the sun or nature and you want to express it. And he, he says, you know, you should just have this kind of uh, propositional gratitude, be grateful that you're alive or be grateful. Except his talk is really weird because throughout this talk, he seems to be saying really moralistic things like you ought to give thanks, you ought to be grateful. And he, he says that, you know, it's not like he's, he's uh, quiet about this, right? It seems like there's this moral injunction that, you know, don't you dare, you know, um, lose track of this fact that your existence is so wonderful and marvelous. And so I also, you know, I also, so there are these pagan groups, there's sort of Dawkins kicking around in my head and I'm sort of thinking that, I also got very interested at this time, this is back two years ago, I think when I started this, or a year ago actually, and, um, realize that there are a lot of stone circles in New England um, where I live. And so, and it's not, we're not talking like Stonehenge or things like that, because that's in old England, merry old England, this is New England. And these are all new and people are building them, right? So, so people are building these stone circles um, like the ones in, you know, Ireland or, you know, Scotland or England. And they're, they're holding rituals in them. And so I thought, well, what are, they, what are they doing? And I've gone to a couple of these rituals and it's like, okay. And I, and I thought, okay, people are doing these things. These Ethiopians are doing it. They celebrate the wheel of the year. So I wanted to think about, okay, look, how, and it always seems shallow to me, Dawkins' answer, like, well, you should just be grateful that. And, and there's, there's, a, you know, there's a number of other academic papers on this, which basically say the same thing. And I thought this is just wrong. And it's weird because you know, Dawkins, who's a biologist and his talk about it never really goes into the biology of gratitude. And there's a large literature on this as I found out about, and you know, he himself is an expert on reciprocity among animals. So I thought, okay, there's gotta be something else here. And yeah, I think there's a there's a completely defensible case for um, saying atheists can give prepositional thanks to things like the sun or you know the earth or nature or evolution. Prepositional meanings you you give thanks to let's say the sun for you know life on earth, etc. Right, and that these things can be done in through uh, rituals that give thanks to the sun and that atheists should do these things or naturalists or you know religious naturalists or so so i got into it from a bunch of different perspectives but you know really wanted to look at the biology of reciprocity and argue that um, you know i don't need to go into the weeds unless you want me to but yes no yeah sure Go ahead, because I think Joe's going to have some clarification questions on the Okay, the yes, I'll be quick. Yeah. I mean, the thought is that humans actually use a series of rules for gratitude, right? Because if you just gave me something, I can say thank you to you. Thanks for giving me that. 
But there are lots of times, and this goes, you know, you know, we get game theory and all this other stuff, which we, I won't go into, but there are lots of times when the person that gave you something isn't there for you to give thanks to them. And then there are, so now there are like fallback rules or you can't give thanks to them because you don't have the resources to like reciprocate, right? And in fact, Thanksgiving is a kind of reciprocity that's sometimes called upstream reciprocity, paying it forward, right? Which just is a signal that, you know, okay, I say, thank you. Why? It seems stupid. I'm not, we already had our fair exchange. Now I say, thank you. You say, you're welcome. This is just a signal that we're both willing to commit to future reciprocity. And sometimes you can't reciprocate because you don't have resources or you, you failed or something happened. And then human, then there are things where now we get into the biology of grooming because we find lots of social animals when they can't reciprocate with you know, actual resources, they reciprocate by grooming. And they use grooming as a technique for future reciprocity. So we get these rules and humans follow too. Right? Like we build monuments to dead soldiers and things. You know, and this is this is a kind of grooming. This ends up being a sort of reciprocity, a symbolic reciprocity, because you can't say thank you to the soldier who's dead. Uh, so you build a monument. What is that? This is a kind of biological kind of grooming. And so you can develop these kinds of ideas to suggest that, look, you know, you can give there's agents. That's the first hurdle. There's lots of agency in nature. It's not all human agency. And so you can be involved in symbolic relations with these things. And the very logic of biological reciprocity lets you, uh, it, it justifies, it shows that it's rational that you should, uh, I shouldn't say should, but it shows that it's rational and proper for you to give thanks to the sun for the benefits it's given you. And you're not worshiping the sun. You're not like bowing down. It's not like, the sun is unchanged by your behavior, right? The sun's not going to give you anything like a special magical solar flare that will kill you. Like if the sun's going to give you anything, it's just going to kill you. Uh, so, so be careful with the sun. So, you know, there are ways to, to really explain, to really, you know, I, I thought this is a kind of thing that atheists often talk about gratitude. Dawkins talks about it repeatedly, you know, Sam Harris, there are, there are plenty of others who talk about oh, the importance of a kind of gratitude. So I want to just say, look, this is the kind of thing I'm interested in. Like, I'm not interested in a half-hearted, you know, like, like, oh, you can do a simulation of gratitude because, and because this is always the story. You're an atheist or you're a naturalist and everything you got is made out of cheap plastic, right? The Christians got the really good stuff. They can really give thanks. You know, when Thanksgiving comes around, you know, the Christian can say, thank God, and I mean it. And the atheist or the naturalist just has to kind of mumble and be like, well, I guess I'm glad that there's that the sun is here or it'd be cold. And it's just it's so like, you know, it, it, it comes like the atheist can't really defend herself or himself. You know, or even if they can defend themselves, your God doesn't exist. They've got nothing to do there, right? And they're on stage for a brief minute and they've got nothing to offer. Or what, or what they have to offer is a cheap imitation of the other thing. So I want to just say, no, right? That's, and to my mind, a lot of that is lazy atheism. To not be lazy means you really have to look really hard and you have to try to see what can be done that you can do. Um, and, I'm, I'm, you know, it's not like being an atheist makes you be able to do this, but as a naturalist, right? Because naturalism gives you the sun, it gives you biology, it gives you the logic of reciprocity, gives you grooming, gives you theory, you know, game theory of animals interacting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so given the science, given the naturalism, you know, the way nature really works, right? You can say, yeah, you know, I can, I can give thanks to the sun. And, and I can do it, and I'm serious, and it's rational, right? And if you're gonna, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if somebody's gonna harass me about why it's rational, I got an argument, I got a second argument, I got, you know, I can back this up. That's the kind of thing I'm interested in, right? Having a naturalism that can function in a culturally positive way. Interesting, yeah, Micah, um... 
I'll turn it over to you, Mike, before like getting into cer certain objections that I might raise, I'll turn it over to you, Micah, so you can ask. Yeah, no, I was going to ask, um, I mean, he covered a lot of um, good stuff I had. I just wanted to clarify, because you did, you did mention like this kind of a thing, maybe, maybe specific to naturalists. So I was going to ask just for uh, further clarification as we're going forward with this, what is it necessarily that makes religious naturalism um, I guess it's a two-part question, kind of like what makes it different from other religious practices in significant ways? And also, if this is a, a pathway, is it only open to naturalists? Well, then what about maybe atheists who wouldn't identify as naturalists? Is it so is it maybe compatible with something like a non-theistic Buddhism? Or would that kind of maybe Mahayana Buddhism or something be an example of atheistic religion, but outside the umbrella of naturalistic or religious naturalism? So I guess uh, just before we get into the weeds with Joe on um, impassibility um, and his eternal war against classical theism, um, <laughs> just kidding, of course, he's uh, res very respectful, of course, to that research project. But um, so, yeah, I guess I just wanted to know for, for clarification, you know, what is it, what are kind of the defining features of religious naturalism that set them apart from other religious practices? And like the thing, so for example, you talk about in the paper, like the atheopaganism, is this something that's only available to religious naturalists or would it be available to atheists who are not naturalists as well and if not what kind of maybe categories would they fit into um so yeah just a couple more things there yeah those are those those are good questions i mean start probably with the uh you know the buddhism or um you know there's a lot of confusion in this realm right i mean sort of actual buddhists you know they believe in things like gods and hungry ghosts and stuff like that and, you know karma and reincarnation and things like that and fine i mean sure i mean america gets a kind of secularized buddhism right a very uh very you know atheistic kind of buddhism and this has also sort of happened in interesting ways with stoicism right like these new versions of stoicism that have appeared um that uh you know, don't get into the fact that the Stoics were big into astrology um, and, you know, believed in this weird Stoic God and had weird practices, you know, just like ignore that stuff. But I think that religious naturalism, right, is a, I mean, it's very vague and it should be, right? It just, I mean, because there are actually are so people like Michael Dowd or, you know, Ursula, Ursula Goodenough, who are sort of Christian religious naturalists or Christian naturalists, although in many cases they're just fictionalists. They think that religious discourse is just poetry that you just say and it doesn't mean anything. You know, and Ursula Goodenough says she goes to church and sings the hymns, even though she knows the words don't mean anything. And that seems bizarre to me. I mean, I'd, I'd like to be sincere. I, you know, I'm not going to. And I mean, and there's one or two points where Dawkins has a similar thing and he's and somebody said well you're a hypocrite and he says well no I'm not I'm, I'm I'm I don't I tell you I don't believe anything any of this stuff I'm honest about that but you want me to do it so it makes you happy it's fine with me um but that seems weird to me that fictionalism religious fictionalism so religious naturalism is more a way of saying like, look, things have objects like religious attitudes or orientations have um, objects, they have intentionality, they're about things, but they're about things that we can think of as natural things in a really broadly construed way. And I think there are certain behaviors probably that really kind of get to what religious naturalism is more than a doctrines like religious naturalists generally don't worship anything right where worship is because you will find there to be religious naturalists who who practice magic you know and they'll say weird things like well magic is just about the manipulation of natural forces or it's about changing your own body in certain ways or changing your intention or being able to name and refer to the possible futures that you would like to bring into actuality, right? And, and they will think things like these rituals and things like this, they reach into your you know, amygdala, your deep brain structures that you can't get to consciously, right? So there are, so there are doctrines about kind of natural magic in religious naturalism, so to some religious naturalists, but generally worship is excluded and prayer, right? So the kinds of, um, but you're trying to find objects in nature, again, very broadly construed, right? So 
Um, you know, uh, David Lewis, one of my favorite, favorite philosophers, uh, poor me, I'm a Lewisian, I drank the Kool-Aid, I confess. <laughs> it's a shameful secret. No, I love David Lewis. Um, you know, he talks about hallucinations and he says, yeah, Macbeth, Macbeth hallucinates a dagger and where's the dagger? And he says, well, to say Macbeth hallucinates a dagger means Macbeth has a counterpart in another possible world who actually sees that dagger. Nice. Because now you can apply this to ghosts, you know, to whatever. And you say, like, I have an ontology of possible worlds. There are all these physicists who talk about the multiverse. Oh, you know, I, I saw a ghost just means, you know, I'm simulating a counterpart in some other possible world who actually saw a ghost in that world. Maybe there are worlds with ghosts. But this is natural in the sense that you're trying to find objects that are at least the same kinds of things that are talked about in the sciences. You know, you don't have to be committed to the existence of other universes to think like maybe David Lewis gives a good analysis of these kinds of human experiences. So, so religious naturalism is a huge kind of category where people are trying to say, look, let's take the sort of proto experiences that people hallucinate. People think, oh, only crazy people hallucinate. No, actually, like lots of people hallucinate all the time. I don't mean all the time, you know, persistent hallucination disorder, but they, you know, have regular glitches in their perceptual systems. These are not exceptional events. And people have, you know, people have like, I have migraines, I have migraine aura, you know, like people with migraine aura, like see and experience all kinds of crazy shit. And so my thought is that there are these kinds and cognitive science of religion, you know, has written a lot about this. People have these kinds of experiences. A lot of times naturalists just dismiss them and they say, oh, it's just the, you know, your migraine aura was just in your head. Not like, well, I know part of it was in my head, but what do you mean it was just in my head, All right? When I saw the black sun open in front of me, ringed with fire, you know, are you saying there was no black sun ringed with fire? And they'll say, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. So here's where we diverge and where it gets to religious naturalism, because I want to say like, yeah, I had a religious experience or a spiritual experience or an ecstatic experience, whatever you want to call that. Again, I'm not really hung up on these names. Um, but I had an experience and my experience was about something. Now, I could just go to the shelf and like pick up the Bible or pick up my, you know, medieval mystic books and say like, what well, was about God? Obviously, obviously, obviously. Or I could just say, no, no, I'm going to look, I'm going to actually think about what an atheistic mystical experience might be, what it might be about. You know, somebody might say it's just about the size of the universe or it refers you to the sublime or the infinity of, the, of reality or something. You know, and fine, fine. But I think religious naturalists are people who take these kinds of experiences pretty seriously and try to figure out what they can mean in a naturalistic framework, right? And, and, and some people are more closed-minded or open-minded about what that framework is. But, you know, there's so, I mean, God, there are like pagan naturalists, Christian naturalists, there are Stoics, there are, you know, naturalistic Buddhists, there are, um, you know, there's all the all the different buckets under the sun, which I think is great, because I think that's the only way we figure out what works. Yeah, no, that that's really interesting that you're talking about um, almost like naturalistic religious experiences. So I'm currently in um, a class with Professor Paul Draper, and uh, it's it's on religious experiences, their epistemology, their phenomenology, and their taxonomy and things like that. And right now we're talking about perennialism, which is roughly the view that um, there's, <laughs> well, it, it, there's this shared common core of, uh, phenomenologically speaking, um, myth, at least with respect to mystical experiences, but other types of religious experiences, phenomenologically speaking, there's this shared common core that's cross-cultural uh, and differences and incompatibilities arise uh, via the interpretive framework that people bring to that common phenomenological core. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering how that interacts with uh, a kind of naturalistic mystical experience or mystical or naturalistic view on religious experience. I hate that stuff, man. <laughs> 
you know what that that perennialism and sneaky sneaky guys that that's just monotheism wrapped in like hippie clothing right of course there's a common core to all of religions they're all just imitations of monotheism and I'm according, I don't mean like, you know, sectarian monotheism, like at that church down the street. I mean, vague, foggy, a little Neoplatonism, a little, you know, Advaita Vedanta, Hindu stuff. It's kind of Eastern, man. No. <laughs> no. Uh, sure. I can do, I can do, I can do the theism thing. If I'm going to do the theism thing, I'm going to be a polytheist. The divine is many. The good is plural. There's no common core to anything. Or if there is a common core and it's being itself, uh, you don't want to experience that because that's like looking into the open reactor core at Chernobyl. You're going to be vaporized. Because being itself will just destroy you and transform you into a million other things. And so, no, no perennialism. No. That, that's, like, that's like people in the 60s who dropped acid, man. <laughs> yeah, don't do drugs. Don't do perennial. Don't, so like, you should, you know, like, dare. Stay away from perennialism. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. That does raise an interesting question. Do you count um, hallucinogens as religious experiences as well? Yes. Like psychedelics. All right, cool. I mean, they can't. I mean, they can be. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, they can be. And, and I don't, I mean, you know, Sam Harris has spoken and written. He's written, but also spoken a lot about that. And, um, but I think that that requires then, like all these things, like a migraine aura or uh, LSD, uh, trip. I mean, it requires interpretation, right? And I'm interested in more naturalistic kinds of interpretations. And I'm also, you know, to, to mention the perennialism again, I'm not going to say that there's one um, core or one way to do it, right? Like I grew up with that, you know, one way, there's one way, there's one way. And so, you know, like John Schellenberg's ultimism, it's the same thing to me. It's just monotheism wrapped in, uh, you know, different clothing. And so I'm, I, you know, I'm interested in, in, and maybe like, okay, like the sciences, maybe the sciences do tend to converge to single models. So maybe you do start to find, you know, certain types of, and we all do have sort of the same brain structure. So maybe you find certain common structures and themes. Right. And maybe there is a kind of underlying grammar to, to all religions in some sense, because we are all human, right? And you do find things, right? So it, it's not that the perennialists were wrong about sort of common struct, that there exist common structures. You know, they're wrong to just interpret it through the lens of monotheism. And so uh, common kinds of structures you find are, yeah, religions all sort of intend to involve dissociative mechanisms, dissociative techniques that induce certain types of trance states, certain types of absorption states. And, you know, you can find good empirical research on this, right? The question now is, can naturalists harness this? Um, so there are, there, yeah, it's valuable to think about common structures, but also then if you're going to be a naturalist, you want to interpret them naturalistically. So, you stay away from that perennialism stuff, man. I'm worried about you now. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't. I wasn't committing to it. I was just bringing up that we're talking about. Yeah, it. Yeah, but you know, you experiment with it, like you <laughs> peer pressure. You're like with the kids, like behind the Seven Eleven, and they're like, "Hey, you want to try some perennialism?" Like, I don't know, man. <laughs> so basically. Like, not that the Crusade Against Ignorance brand TM would endorse using psychedelics, but it's probably a preferable alternative to perennialism, which, you know, maybe we'll just say without any legal binding here or uh, accountability, perhaps. <laughs> well, you could talk about all kinds of things in their religious, religious import, right? And I mean, there are people today who, you know, it's funny if you look at the psychedelic movement today, which is enormous, right? Um, with, you know, Rick Doblin and, and MAPS, right? The Multi -dis Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, right? They're trying to bring it back as a medicine. 
And, you know, there are some people who are trying to, to think about psychedelics also in religious terms, but not, so now you have a big split because there are still some people like William Richards, who's a real old timer, actually was part of the Good Friday experiment back in the 60s, who still has this perennialist view of what psychedelics are about. And then there's a whole group of uh, younger and very exciting researchers, uh, Chris Lethaby, I'll mention, who are, who are really trying to say like, no, wait a minute, let's think about this stuff scientifically and not come at it from this, you know, and maybe at the end of the day, maybe at the end of the day, the science goes down an unexpected road, but you're approaching it scientifically and trying to understand what, what's really going on. So was that, was that an answer to a question? Yeah. Was there a question? Yeah. No, no, I think it was. Micah, is, it, is, it cool yeah. if, is it cool if we go on to, I guess, my yeah. um, criticism bringing in Dr. Marcus Hunt's work? Um, yeah, for sure. So uh, for the audience, uh, I actually had on my channel, Dr. Marcus Hunt, and he wrote a paper and it was recently published in the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. It was on fitting prepositional gratitude to an impassable God. And so um, I was actually struck by some of the similarities uh, between uh, Eric's paper on the one hand and that paper on the other, because Eric in his paper, he, he, he went through and he's talking about um, like the ancient gods who were completely immutable and impassable. And, and, and he, was, he was relating this to some of, some of the things that he's recommending giving thanks to in some sense, like deep agents or things that are in some sense immutable and impassable, uh, at least relative to us. And so I was wondering if, if we could bring in uh, Dr. Hunt's criticism of prepositional gratitude to an impassable God into this context and argue that, well, actually, no, like deep agents like the sun and evolution and other things, uh, we cannot fittingly give prepositional gratitude to them. And so roughly, here's the general outline of how that argument would work. So premise one would say something like, um, if, if something, if some X cannot be benefited well, then X cannot be a fitting target of prepositional gratitude. And then the second premise would say, well, these kind of non-living, impersonal, unconscious things cannot be benefited. And so it follows that uh, they cannot be a fitting target of prepositional gratitude. Now, for that first premise, uh, Marcus Hunt, he argues that, well, a necessary condition for prepositional gratitude is a desire to benefit the benefactor. It's this desire that you have to benefit the benefactor. And then step two in arguing for that premise, he says, well, a desire to benefit a benefactor is fitting only if it's metaphysically possible in the first place for the benefactor to be benefited, where benefit is just a kind of increase in well being or preventing a decline in well being. Um, and then uh, so. That, that's kind of his argument for premise one. And then it does seem to be the case that premise two, these non-living, impersonal, unconscious things, they, they can't really increase in their well-being. And so um, really he, he's, he's analyzing benefits and prepositional gratitude in terms of the fittingness of desires for benefiting. But there are some things where it's literally metaphysically impossible for them to be benefited. And hence desiring that, there be ben that they be benefited would be sort of unfitting. And hence he argues that uh, you can't really give fitting prepositional gratitude to them. It's a bit complicated, but that's the structure of the objection. So I'm wondering what you think about that objection to your, your paper. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, he and I are just gonna disagree on what gratitude means. I mean, that seems to me to load on his view, okay, you've got a concept of, um, you know, being benefited and having well-being and giving thanks is a desire to benefit something by increasing its well-being. This, to my mind, packs in, um, this is the kind of philosophy that I don't do. I mean, this packs in so much already into the first premise that I have to agree with like an enormous, you know, it seems like the first premise is innocent. What's behind the first premise is an entire theory you know, an entire metaphysics of um, this concept of gratitude. And I'm going to just say, where did you get that from? Mm -hmm. Right? Where did you get that? Where did you get that from? So we have a methodological kind of divergence, yeah. right? I'm going to try to take the concept of gratitude or giving thanks um, from nature. I'm going to go, I'm going to turn to science, and, which I did in my paper. 
right? And, you know, I'm going to start to look at, I mean, fine, I'll look at humans, but I'm going to say humans evolved. And this behavior in us has evolutionary roots. It has an evolutionary history. And if we, uh, you know, go back through the evolutionary past or just even today look in biology at other things, right? We go back in the evolutionary past. We try to see about the evolution of gratitude and we immediately come to this key notion of reciprocity, right? And, we, and then you immediately see all kinds of strategies that um, animals have worked out to exchange, even plants actually do this, um, trees and fungi, right? That interact symbiotically. And so you immediately come to animals that have to reciprocate and face problems in reciprocity. You immediately come to the game theoretic results. Look, if it's all tit for tat, right? And so I'll cooperate if you cooperate and you wanna cooperate, but suddenly some bad thing happened. A bird took your fish and now you can't give me the fish. And I'll say like, well, you just defected. And since we're both playing tit for tat, now I defect. And now we're just in a negative bad place. Right, but it and it, but it was an accident. You didn't want, you didn't want to be, you know, in this defect defect situ game. You know, you don't want war. You wanted to give me the fish. The bird took the fish. You know, okay, right. These kinds of accidents can be disastrous for for a community of cooperators, right? Because they immediately switch into this game theoretic, you know, nuclear war, and so. Right. So one argument in biology is like, well, okay, grooming emerges as a way to solve this problem. You can't reciprocate with food, but you can groom, right? Or in human cases, you can reciprocate symbolically. And some people have argued that, I mean, one of the most interesting theories of the emergence of language is that it comes from grooming. It's actually how, you know, and you can see chimpanzees groom each other through linguistic exchanges. So I'm going to turn to biology and game theory, right? I'm going to turn to these, you know, mathematics of game theory, to the facts of biology, to get a concept of what gratitude is, right? I'm not going to approach it with, oh, okay, here's my, and I appreciate, you know, I appreciate sort of this kind of conceptual analysis, but what's built into it is you think you're like, well, my intuitions tell me, well, yeah, your intuitions are just like entirely from a Christian culture. You know, your intuitions aren't a guide to anything. So his view to me looks like you have to start with a premise that's been based on I don't know what. But why do I believe that's what gratitude is? I mean, if I want to look at gratitude, I'm going to turn to science and I'm going to see if there is a science of gratitude, a scientific account. And there is. And so I'm going to start with that and now apply it to humans. And immediately, of course, what you see is that his definition doesn't even apply to humans. But humans do all kinds of symbolic acts that are expressing thanks, you know, that are not related to anything. I mean, they give thanks to their ancestors. This is common around the world where the ancestors, they're dead. You know, they're not even giving thanks to their grave, you know, or I have a little statue of the ancestor. It doesn't even look like the guy. And so, you know, and, and humans obviously build monuments to fallen soldiers. And yeah. there are actually monuments that humans have built to dogs and, um, the, you know, the mice, the experimental mice. To like laboratory mice and to like insects, to cotton weevils. And so you got to just say right, right away, it's like, well, as a matter of empirical fact, no. So, so it's, it, there I think, yeah, there's a good, it's a, an interesting objection, right? Um, I don't mean to dismiss the objection. It's just, a, it's just false, right? Gratitude just like, where did you, but the, the methodological difference is the key thing there, I think, right? When coming to any of these things, right? Um, mystical experience, gratitude, wanting to give thanks to the sun, right? Wanting to, uh, you know, dance out in the woods with the trees and uh, in a stone circle and, and or like, you know, chant or something. I, I want to know what's, what's this about. And I'm going to try to turn to science for figuring out what I'm doing when I'm in those mental states. Right. Uh, did that help? Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. It's interesting how there's a kind of more fundamental or underlying methodological dispute there. So that, that was yeah. good. That I'm, I'm glad we were able to, to cover that one. Micah, do you have any further things to add on this or uh, changing the question or anything? Um, yeah, on this one, and maybe um, Hunt has addressed this in regards to classical theism, but I believe, uh, Eric, in your paper, you also mentioned 
um, as far as giving gratitude, um, not necessarily always even being necessarily benefiting the agent, the object of your gratitude, but how some of, say, ancient pagans, Stoics, and others viewed it was as sort of contemplative, but also beneficial for the person who is giving gratitude themselves. Sometimes the object can be uh, the object of prayer, I guess right. that'd be more in the theistic traditions, but also giving gratitude is more so to change because, you know, these, you talked about in the paper, I believe, how a lot of the ancient um, polytheists, they recognized that their gods, you know, were, again, impassable, so really didn't, uh, weren't changed much by their gratitude or prayer, but they still did it kind of as a reflective exercise and as well as to change themselves and their behavior. Um, so I believe you, you mentioned that in the paper as well, as far as it kind of being for our benefit, not necessarily because we understand, of course, that the sun doesn't care. If we give thanks to it or not, obviously, you know, the sun. How the, dare uh, you blaspheme know, the sun? <laughs> At least I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so the sun doesn't seem to, you know, the evolving biosphere, they're not going to be like offended if we don't give thanks to them, but um, it can still be beneficial for us as agents. So uh, in further defense of your your point um, in the paper, um, Joe, did you want to add anything on that as far as this hunt address set or is that? Um, I, I think he talks about how uh, it could, we could be t talking about how you know giving thanks to this impassable god could be affecting us and so on but he's really trying to focus on whether or not that act directed towards god increases god's well-being and how that bears okay. on the fittingness conditions of that of that prepositional gratitude so it's it's an interesting point but i think his focus is slightly different but yeah, yeah. That, makes, that makes sense I mean, I think that you find, I mean, also to think about this, the issue of gratitude and the impassable gods and, and uh, right, again, I mean, the, the ancient pagans would, would have been mostly opposed to, to uh, Hunt's paper too. I mean, the thought that they, you know, especially among the Neoplatonists and the later Neoplatonists and Romans, the gods are, you know, and it's, and it's a really interesting question whether they're even theistic gods, right, whether in Iamblichus or Plotinus, you even have theistic gods, because the gods don't care about you. Yeah, I mean, especially the Plotinian, I mean, the Plotinian one, I mean, it does it, the mind, right, the, the noose, that's the second hypostasis that, that is created by the one. The one isn't even the mind. It doesn't even have ideas. It's just this pure, undifferentiated right. oneness. Um, yeah, kind of like Brahman too. A little bit. Exactly. <laughs> see, this is your perennialist, perennial, see, this is, you have, <laughs> you're gonna need some therapy. Uh, yeah detox man <laughs> it's just like what are you in for i was a perennialist oh man we got a special wing for you guys yeah yeah so right though i mean all those things those ancient ancient roman kinds of gods right the gods of Iamblichus, they are busy doing cosmic shit right i mean like they're busy i don't know what they're doing maybe nowadays you would say like they make you know fusion go you know or they're making things and the way that they make things happen i mean it really is almost like the gods of Iamblichus are just these natural powers right they're not even uh they're not really even persons in any way you know they're these very strange things and yeah they are not affected by you right because they don't know that you exist they don't care that you exist they don't have uh thoughts and emotions that are directed towards humans uh their natures are really strange. And so, okay, should we just not do sacrifices or, you know, prayers of the kinds that the ancients did uh, or do these things? And, you know, Iamblichus and then Celestius, right, who's a follower of his um, and almost the emperor. I guess Celestius, no, Celestius was not emperor. He turned it down. Um, but, these guys said, well, you do these things because they change you in certain ways, right? You can't change the gods. You can't change the gods at all. And, but that doesn't mean that you can't have proper orientations towards them, right? I mean, everything in nature is something, especially for the ancients, that you have to have a proper orientation to. You know, there are ways that you ought to act towards things. Of course, ways you ought to act towards other people, but also ways you ought to act towards, you know, the state, the commonwealth, Rome, to the earth, to all the nations, to all these, and the Stoics and others, right, they get into that. And so you should have, you, there are proper ways to orient yourself towards the gods. And, okay, philosophers, ancient philosophers differed about that, but you still have these duties, and you do them because you are a certain thing. 
right? You have a position in the ancient times, you have a position in the great chain of being, and you need, you ought to behave in certain ways towards these superior things, right? It doesn't matter if they, you know, you ought to behave in a certain way to Caesar, even though Caesar doesn't know that you exist, right? Um, and so it's, okay, it's sort of like that, but you have to have these proper orientations. And it's not, it. I, I would just stress here to think about some of these other things, religious naturalism, Sagan paganism. I mean, if you look at ancient pagan thought of Greece and Rome and you start to realize, right, and more scholars are doing this now and they have been for about 50 years, you know, de-Christianizing it because it all got baptized. And when you read somebody, and, and there are now people are translating this stuff, right? There's good, you can easily get a cheap and very good translation of Yamblichus's, right, on the mysteries. And you start to, to read these things and realize what ancient pagans, you know, of Greece and Rome were doing. And it just is, to me, it is endlessly fascinating. And in, in some ways, both very alien and also um, very timely. Right. So in many, so the paper I, I did on giving thanks to the sun, right, it quotes a lot of ancient literature. Right. Um, and ways they thought about um, giving thanks, about contemplative prayer, about, and in many ways, this is interesting too, because by the time of Iamblichus or even Plotinus, these guys are distinguishing themselves from the Christians. Right. They, there are Christians, Christianity is emerging, it's, it's growing. Um, it's eventually going to overtake ancient paganism. But for those couple of centuries, the 200s, the 300s, and even a little bit in the four, 400s is really too late. But the 200s and 300s, these guys are trying to articulate ancient paganism as a religious alternative. And when you really start to read it, you go like, yeah, wow, this isn't theism. This is different. And what they're doing is really strange and it's kind of exciting and interesting. So, yeah, a little connection with the ancient stuff and hopefully some of its relevance. I think it's really relevant today um, to think about, okay, if we're trying to construct kinds of cultures that have, you know, positive elements that are naturalistic, okay, what did the ancient pagans think about mystical experience, right? What did they think about giving thanks? What did they think about uh, prayer? Yeah. Um, so I guess, Micah, sorry to jump in, but I, I do have to, I wanted to say this, like, you, we, we've been talking about the importance of, you know, providing these other avenues, not restricting ourselves to just, for instance, American Protestant Christianity. So, and especially with regard to your work, the kind of naturalistic or uh, those kinds of religious avenues. So with that in mind, let's grant that that, that is a very important and valuable enterprise. How do we go forward from here, right? What do we do? Like, how do we go about building these kinds of institutions and, yeah, uh, advancing this cause? TikTok. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, Instagram. What are, <laughs> what are the, what are the cool kids doing? I mean, uh, I think that we try all kinds of things, right? We, we, um, I don't. Well, I feel it's very self-defeating. I mean, for naturalists or atheists to always be in a negative and critical mode, right? Um, so, I so there are the atheopagans, right? And they're out dancing around and, and on the wheel. They do the wheel of the year, you know, um, solstices, equinoxes, and the four cross quarter days in between. And yeah, you know, it's like not like there's a you know a close knit group, but there are groups, right? And so there are the Stoics. There are these people who are doing a kind of naturalized Buddhism. There are people who are doing, um, you know, the Burning Man. There's transformational festivals. Uh, I mean, so I think that there's uh, a, there's a thousand opportunities and a thousand. You know, I don't like it. Would what a shame it would be to straitjacket it and say there's there's just you know one way. No, there's many ways, and you're going to just see all kinds of spiritual and religious creativities pop up. I am I am really open-minded about all this stuff. And so I, I think when there are, there are naturalists who are really critical, they're very critical, some, some, you know, I get pushed back from some who say like, we don't want any religion or spirituality. It's, 
And it's like, look, man, that's, that's, you know, that's just a self-defeating position because nobody wants to be around you now. You know, nobody wants to like, nobody, because you don't have anything to offer, right? And the Pastafarians have more to offer than you do. You know, the satanic temple, they've got like, they've got their crazy stuff. And um, so I think that there's going to be a thousand, a thousand things. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's good. I think, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Well, to maybe you, a you mentioned, well, you mentioned something about, um, you know, people like being sort of antagonistic maybe towards this project. And I believe, Joe, didn't you have a question based on that? I have like one or two more like little things, but if you wanted to do, you had a question about that really quick about objections, right? Yeah, I mean, I know we're nearing sort of the end, so I'll be brief, but I, I'm wondering what's some of like the pushback that you've received to this kind of project of, uh, you know, naturalistic religion or, you know, paganism or, or what have you. I think there's like two, there's, there's probably a couple, but one is, um, to, to do quick is the, um, you know, sometimes if you use these kinds of words, like you say spiritual, and you'll get some, some uh, guy, it's always a guy who, um, or rituals or something like that, or, you know, maybe I'll post something in a naturalist group about, you know, Sasha Pagan, uh, yeah, Sasha Pagan, Sasha Sagan's uh, recent book, um, you know, uh, on rituals. And somebody will say like, we don't want, you know, these words are confusing or prayer, you know, like, or, or gratitude or something like, you know, I'll say like, well, I think, you know, atheists can have altars and pray because some do. And so some will say like, you can't use that word. And I'll say, why not? And you'll say, well, people are confused. And I'll say, are you confused? And I'll say, no. And I'll say, well, the theists certainly aren't confused because I'm really clear that it's atheistic. So who's confused? Well, you can't use that word. Why not? Well, look at the dictionary. Always the dictionary. You know, I'm always, if there's one objection that I get consistently, it's the dictionary. Man. And I, you know, like my reply is always the same. It's like, you know, who wrote your dictionary? I mean, dictionaries record the culturally dominant usage. And in a culturally Christian, you know, Christian dominated culture, you got a Christian dictionary. Why, you know, like I know why a theist says prayer is talking to God. I know why a theist says that. Why would an atheist say that? And you say like, well, because that's what prayer is. And then I think like, so really you're a cultural Christian, right? You don't think God exists, but you believe in Christian culture. You accept the Christian meanings of words. You accept the network of Christian concepts. So you're just a cultural Christian. I mean, and then, then I'm usually on pretty good ground with a lot of the people who are objecting. Because then they'll have to think like, oh, wait, why am I using Christian meanings? You know, why, why do I think prayer means what the Christians mean? And, but yeah, I think that, you know, trying to like repurpose words, right? And I'm, I'm always careful when I try to do that. I try to, I try to say like, well, look, there was an older usage of this word, right? And it, here's where it comes from. I mean, the word spirit comes from Stoicism. It's the Stoic pneuma translated into Greek, into, from Greek into Latin. So, you know, I like to, so there's a, usually, I, I don't know why it is. I find it older. There was a sort of old grumpy atheist who really is very hostile. And um, that's the position they like to be in. I don't think, I, I think that's been a disaster for atheism and naturalism, because um, people don't want to people don't want to socialize with you now, and people don't, you know, and you're not going to form a group, you're not going to be able to mobilize voters, you're not going to have an agenda, you're not going to be able to change policy, you're not going to, you can sit in your room in your room and be really cranky and go to your skeptics conference, and that has been a strategy of failure and defeat, um, as far as I can tell, forever. Yeah, that's Micah, good stuff. I'll yeah, yeah. No, I got just a couple more things, I guess. Um, I thought, you know, as far as maybe not even an objection go, but a question people might have reading your paper. Like, again, you've covered some of this as we've gone along, but just to make it even more explicit, um, people might look at this paper, paper, and even just as like a knee-jerk reaction, like reading the abstract or something, they'll be like, like, why would I, why would I give thanks to the sun revolution? Like, sure, I'm here, but like, 
what's the point? And maybe, maybe you know, if they don't, um, I mean, would you couch that completely in terms of like what we're talking about in terms of like, it benefits me to give thanks because this is like a, you know, a spiritual practice that's beneficial to me, like psychologically or whatever. But people might just have this initial of like, okay, why, why in the world would I want to give this prepositional gratitude towards something like the sun, like these um, like natural agents, like sure I'm here, you know, the biosphere helped produce me, but like it already did, you know, why would you I give thanks You ungrateful to wretch. <laughs> Exactly. So, I mean, would you couch the value of like, you know, because I, I think as you've said before, maybe wouldn't want to make it a, a term of like, ought, like you not, maybe it's not necessarily that you ought do this if you're a naturalist, but it's rational to just, so the pitch. If, if somebody, just give yeah. the pitch, like, like someone, yeah, exactly. imagine yeah. you read your abstract yeah. to someone and they're just giving you this blank stare and they're like, what the hell, bro? Yeah. Hey, like, why like, would I do that? What's your yeah. pitch? What's your pitch to them? What's your like close, like, here's why you should think this really in shortest terms. Cause you got to do something with your kids on Saturday. That's you know short and sweet. I like it. You know, just having so I guess this is my that's part of what my question was about. Really, like, does this sort of like come out of like a deeper, maybe evolutionarily human need for rituals, or you know, for something intrinsically valuable to them? Like, is there something maybe intrinsically valuable to rituals, or is it just benefit we get from it? Or you know, is this where does this all? Come I think from? both of those. I think to yeah, to just be really quick. I mean, look, there are things that people do, and so you know, obviously, lots of people have families. They got kids. They got young kids. They want to socialize with their neighbors. They want to do, or, you know, people, other people in town, they want to do things and where are they going to go? Well, the only thing that's there is the church. And so if you're going to be a naturalist or an atheist or, you know, secularist or whatever, uh, you're going to be lonely. And what are you going to do? Like your kids want to go play with their friends and neighbors and things like that. And you want to do things and get together. And so, you know, you find, right. So when this is one of the interesting, heartening things, and it's also relevant to the Sasha, Sasha it's like when it's all those S's, Sasha Sagan, right. Is like writing from the perspective of a mom. And so you're going to want to do things and social things. And what are the social things we're going to do? Well, here's one. Right. And then you've also got this Thanksgiving holiday. So here's why you can give thanks. You can be an atheist or a naturalist and give thanks at Thanksgiving. Huge American holiday. Here is a way directly for naturalists, atheists and similar folks to right, endorse and participate in this holiday as full equals. Right. So I think two, two things. Right. You got your kids and you got you got to do something on Thanksgiving. And um, that's, you know, that's my, my thought about all these things. It's like Christmas cards. Everybody sends Christmas. What am I going to do? Send a Christmas card? Ha, ha, ha. So see, you really do believe in Jesus. It's like, well, no, I'll send a winter solstice card, right? But now I'm building a culture, right? Now I'm building things for people to do. And if a bunch of moms want to get together and talk about, teach their kids about the sun, Right. And say, like, well, we do this other thing. Right. Because, like, we don't have to be all lonely and we can get together and have fun. We can have a picnic. Right. Um, we can go out and we can make, you know, the, the kids can put up some little stones and like cast little shadows and stuff. But they do this. I mean, I've actually, right. I mean, I've actually seen um, groups of mothers, like, you know, and you'll see in these, for instance, the atheopaganism group, right? There are lots of young mothers who are looking for things to do with their kids that aren't going to be indoctrinating them into American Christianity, right? But yet are going to give their kids opportunities because their kids socialize and they socialize with their other friends and their friends are like, come to church, let's go to church. And they're like, oh, I don't want to go to church. What are we going to do? And so you find these mothers talking a lot about kinds of things they can do with their kids, right? And so you can do things. You can build an altar in your house, right? And you can build an atheist altar, and uh, you can do things. What are we going to do on Halloween? Well, Halloween's actually one of the cross quarter days, right? Easter's a cross quarter day. Um, you've got the soul, you know, Christmas is like basically the solstice. And so you can say, like, yeah, we have our own holidays and we do our own thing, right? So it's, to my mind, it's building a positive culture and it's building a culture that has equal rights because it's equally as deep and it can make equally deep claims. So there you go. Okay. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So, hey, it's almost Halloween time, everybody, at the time of recording. So this is a great time to get out and do some uh, Ethiopian rituals with your friends, you know, dress up by, uh, you know, some black candles or something. 
uh interesting <laughs> <laughs> or just do agnostic rituals it's just like you're like just sitting there weighing the evidence no <laughs> wow <laughs> as long as it's not perennialism yeah that's that's good um I'll tell you the yeah. scales <laughs> that's all that's great yeah i love that answer i want to end us on maybe like a fun note we talked about this a little bit earlier so you've, you've covered most of it but just to end on a kind of fun note um a lot of times there's kind of this common trope of um you know people th th label spiritual but not religious being associated with like again astrology tarot cards and see i wish i didn't i was speaking about this more third person but i recently sat in on a tarot card reading so i'm kind of uh i have a first person it wasn't mine it was somebody else's that they, you know they asked me to come along um, so I kind of have a first person now subjective experience of what some it's of like this... you just gave like the peer pressure drug speech, man. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do like I didn't want to go to the tower car with there with my friends. <laughs> my friends like said, come on, it'll be cool. Can't okay, hurt. Well, to be fair, it was a girl I was going out at the time. So that's more compelling than drugs, yeah, probably. Yeah. At least they should. So, you know, peer I pressure. kind of had to. Peer you know, pressure. Sort of so yeah but just in terms of um <laughs> in terms of this like you know religious naturalism religious spirituality as far as distancing it from those practices uh you want to of course resolutely say that it it has nothing to do with that it's more about um rituals community so do you have any remarks on uh drawing that distinction sharply or did we cover all that earlier <laughs> no i think it's worth saying a, a couple things uh quickly i mean i think it's uh, you know i was i was uh really surprised uh, I think two years ago, I taught a philosophy of religion class and um, it's filled with atheists. And I mean, there are religious people in the class too. There's a broad, really broad mix um, at my university. And I was very surprised that all the atheists were deeply committed to astrology. And, you know, I'm not, I, you know, and I hadn't really been aware of how popular astrology had become. And, um, you know, they would all have these, like this app co-star or the pattern or something. Um, and so I became fascinated with that. Um, and, and, you know, because I'm, I'm, I mean, I gotta be interested in what they're doing, I gotta learn about them and figure out what, what they're into. And, you know, right. I mean, it turns out that a lot of things like, you know, probably astrology is mainly practiced in the US today in a serious way not newspaper horoscopes, because any astrologer will immediately tell you that's bullshit. I mean, that's not how, that's not astrology. Um, it's a kind of applied stoicism. And, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly not the first to, to write about that. You know, there was an article, I think, in the Atlantic on astrology and millennials and young people. And it's really a kind of, you're learning a lot of psychodynamic techniques. It's almost like, you know, stoicism, rational emotive behavioral therapy, it's really, or cognitive behavioral therapy is what it turns out, right? So it's like this Reiki thing that we started at the beginning, right? It presents itself as one thing and you're thinking, why are people doing this? And you got to think because they're getting some benefit, right? And it turns out that it's another thing, right? And astrology ends up doing all these fascinating like social things like I'm not an asshole, but Mercury is retrograde, right? And now we can add, and this is, and you think like, well, so what? This bullshit, Mercury's retrograde, does that explain why? But no, what it does is it now gives us a way to talk about my behavior without judging me. We've got a cognitive distancing technique, right? There are, and you, you know, you could people, other people have written about this kind of stuff. You can go into this, the ways that astrology actually provides for people who have, you know, who are using it, provides a whole language and system for negotiating interpersonal conflict, which is just fascinating when you get into it, right? Um, because you know what, we have to make a decision and it would really be shitty if it looked like I was trying to dominate you and it'd be really shitty if you were trying to dominate me. Let's turn to a neutral third party that is guaranteed to be on neither side. The stars, right? If you start to look at how astrology is used. So I'm actually, you know, yeah, when you talked about that woo stuff and spirituality, what it does seem, what it seems to me is lots of the woo woo provides very interesting, um, you know, it's like herbal medicine, right? It's like, yeah, you don't believe the explanation for why this works, but you go and see 
is there some molecule in that plant that actually does work, right? With astrology, you don't believe like the bullshit woo-woo story about the stars are causing me to like be a jerk. You actually go to look, well, like what are people actually doing? So I think a lot of that woo-woo stuff provides because it's been around forever. It obviously does something. In, in fact, if you wanted to talk about the universal religion of humanity, it would be astrology. And one of the things that's interesting about astrology, like as my atheist students pointed out immediately, is there are no gods. There are no gods here, man. There's just planets, you know, and the moon and the sun and the earth, right? <laughs> There's, there's like, you know, like, I don't believe in any gods. I certainly believe in Venus and Mars. And so I think a lot of, you know, astrology is, is like through every culture. And it's ancient and it persists no matter what, right? Nobody can stamp it out. The early Christians try to stamp it out. They can't, right? It's just, and it's, it's everywhere. And so you got to think this is solving some human problem, right? So this is often, you know, again, a point of conflict between me and atheists, other naturalists or atheists is I say, look, this stuff must be solving some problem. Like if you're a biologically, you know, biologically oriented person, you're going to say like, we're animals, we have behaviors and the behaviors have to, in some sense, be adaptive or they would have been selected against. They wouldn't be here. So what are these things doing, right? So I, I, I think that naturalists need to look at all that stuff, all of it, and try to figure out what's going on. You look at it from the point of view of cognitive science of religion, game theory, right? Sort of social dynamic theory. And you try to figure out what are people doing, right? So I don't just, you know, I don't just, you know, when it comes to like raw materials, yeah, I don't, you know, divination is really interesting. Tarot cards, if you think tarot cards are about like, and, and there's great stuff about this. If you guys look around, right, if people look around, you know, there are naturalistic, you know, tarot card readers and people who are into the naturalistic way and will say things like, look, actually tarot evolved to be like this really fascinating system for analyzing um, conflicts within personalities right? Like the tarot cards themselves kind of evolved to have these meanings as people were using them. And so you can use these as a sort of psychotherapeutic tool. Or you can also use them to provide certain, you know, one of the things that people often need is a random number generator. And Right, so these kinds of techniques can often provide random numbers. They provide random numbers. What do random numbers do? They break ties. What are ties? Ties are conflicts, right? Break a tie in a neutral way, right? The tarot card said so. It's not me. It's not you. It's the tarot card. It's like the world said this. And you've got a neutral, a lot of these things turn out to be like neutral third parties in conflict resolution, or they turn out to be symbol systems that people can use um, and I, and yeah, let me, I'll encourage you guys too to go look at like all the stuff that naturalists, there are all kinds of people who identify as naturalists, as atheists, who practice ceremonial magic, who practice spell casting, who practice tarot readings, who do occult rituals, who are into astrology. And they're all giving these just fascinating explanations of what they're doing. Right, like, and, and they're not doing the, like, they're like, yeah, the, the, the woo-woo thing, like, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't care about that. But like, if people are willing to pay money to go to people who perform Reiki on them, it's gotta be doing something, you know? And if it persists and spread around the world, and then you learn about like ASMR, like, oh, there's a natural explanation for what the people, the explanation is often very hidden, but if you look at, start to look around at the people who are doing this naturalistic stuff with paganism or the occult or, I mean, to my mind, some of the most fascinating stuff is, is uh, the people are doing like naturalistic ceremonial magic, right? And they're talking about the ways that they are turning to old classical sources as well and medieval sources as well as their own stuff that they're making up of learning how to kind of, you know, reprogram their minds or consciousness, 
And, um, and of course, you know, Sam Harris doing it, you know, eating his mushrooms and things like that. I mean, well, but he does. I mean, you know, people are doing these things. Uh, so that, that stuff is, is um, fascinating, I think, to hear how people are taking these um, old systems and trying to repurpose them, right? Or looking for the, what are the naturalistic explanations for why they have effects on human minds, right? I mean, it is weird. I just had a birthday and a birthday, it, it actually took me probably like more than 50 of those birthdays to realize what my birthday meant, which was that I had just orbited the sun. You know, like it's, and suddenly that's like, well, that's, that's really interesting, right? Like what I'm celebrating is orbits around the sun. And that gives me a really weird way of starting to calculate time. And now isn't time weird? And so, yeah. So I, and you know, there's a guy who says like, you can use birthdays to, to use the periodic table of elements to illustrate your birthdays. First birthday is your hydrogen birthday. Your second birthday is your helium birthday. And this now unfolds into the whole thing of stars generating complex elements. And, and we make rituals and meanings and things like this. So there you go, right? Interesting. Uh, should you worship the sun for uh, you know keeping us in orbit? No worship, whatever, man. That's your perennialism. Gratitude. That's, that's, yeah, gratitude. That's that. That stuff. It gets into you. You think you're doing it with with you know your girlfriend or something. It's just for fun, you know. And then it's just on the weekends, <laughs> you know. And then like you're gonna be in rehab. Uh, you know, it's like this is oh, this is a one way street, my friend. Perennialism does not end well. So stay away from perennialism is the the key message yeah. of uh, one of the key messages at least of this yeah video. no and no worship we don't grovel right i'll leave yeah the, i'll leave you like an old wiccan uh phrase which was whenever anyone bows to the goddess the goddess says rise that sounds very wiccan yes right I, yeah. It'd be nice. To, it'd be uh, fun to talk a little more about that stuff too at some point. I know we're closing our time out here. Uh, Joe, did you have anything else? Any closing remarks or questions last minute? No, Mark? I just uh, thank you, Micah, for having me on to uh, sort of co-host this. And thank you, Eric, for that that wonderful discussion. Yeah, yeah thanks thank for you. being here, Joe. And yes, uh, Dr. Um, Steinhardt, thank you so much for coming. This is uh, yeah. really, uh, really fun, enlightening, and uh, informative for me. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed your paper a lot. been enjoying this project of yours. I'm very uh, interested in it. So thank you for being here. It was great. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. It's been a great discussion. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you as well. And uh, we'll see you next time.